good methodology for approaching dynamic programming problems is this. First, always write the recursive equation. Because if you cannot write the recursion, remember, all of dynamic programming is based on this concept that you are just optimizing recursion. You, you might either optimize it just by this mechanical transformation of taking the recursion and attaching caching to it. That's called recursion with memoization or top down. Um, or you might take it a step further and do that bottom up transformation where you, based on your knowledge of the problem, you specify the order in which the cases are evaluated rather than rely on the recursion to produce it for you. But either way, you do need a recursive formula to start out with. Even if, it, remember, we saw that in the uh, bottom-up approach, the final code may have no recursion because in the final code, uh, everything's been optimized away and all the recursive calls have been optimized away. But still, you need to start with some kind of recursion. Uh, so this is step one. You have, to, you have to get a recursive formula. Then you can apply top-down, and then you can, or you can look for ways to optimize it to bottom-up. Okay, so, so let's look at a uh, sample problem. Okay, so this one is only going to be like a little bit more difficult than the previous one, and it's going to be kind of like similar, but this is kind of a more classic dynamic programming problem you see in various sources. So this is called the Robert problem. Many of you have probably heard of this. So the idea of the Robert problem is there is basically a, there is basically a street, and on the street are houses. So there are various houses on the street, like, like so. Their positions doesn't really matter. What matters is like which houses are adjacent to other houses. So here's some houses. And there's a robber that's going to kind of rob these houses, basically. Um, now, every house has like a certain value. The robber has already staked out the houses uh, and has assigned a value to each house. So this one is worth 10, this one is worth 5, this one is worth 2, 8, 6, 12, and 2. Okay, these are just random numbers I came up with. Uh, okay, now here's the thing. The robber wants to rob as many houses, like he wants to maximize his total value. Like think of each value as like the value of the goods the robber expects to steal. So the robber wants to maximize his total value. But the only thing is that if, he, if the, rob, the robber knows that if he breaks into two houses that are like adjacent to each other, the neighbors will like talk to each other or something and get reported. Uh, you know, it'll get reported and maybe eventually that increases his risk of being caught. Uh, or maybe after he breaks into one house, the neighbors are not alert or something. And so he doesn't want to break into two houses that are adjacent to each other. It's kind of a contrived scenario, I know. But like, okay, he doesn't want to break into, he doesn't want to break into uh, any two adjacent houses. So given that, how do you maximize the robber's payoff? Now, note that it is not always optimal to like, you might think it's optimal to either take this sequence or this sequence, right? You might, you might think that like one of these two sequences has to be optimal, but that's not necessarily the case. Because for example, here actually, already I think we're showing like probably why this is not the case. It's actually really good, like, like basically, uh, but, oh, well, okay, let's bump this one value, this value even more. Like these two houses are really, really valuable. So the robber doesn't want to miss either of these houses. So it's actually best for the robber to get like this house, this house, and this house. With, if the robber doesn't, like see, the robber doesn't want to get this 10 and then get this two and then miss out on the 15. Nor does the robber want to miss out on this 10 by starting five and then getting the 15. It's actually better for the robber to get this 10 and then get this 15. It's true that you would never have a gap of more than two. Two is like the maximum gap, right? Because if there's another house in between, like a seven, you know, you can just grab it for free. Uh, I'm assuming here all the houses have positive value. I mean, you know, there's not, no house where like, you know, you get into the house and you could rob it yourself. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, surprise. Uh, okay, uh, so, yeah, this is the thing. Okay, so, uh, First, we must ask, what is the recursive formula here? So it's actually going to be kind of similar to the formula we had before. So, uh, and this is just general advice I give with recursive formulas. Write the general case first. Like the base cases are important for like, the actual implementation, but the base cases usually don't really affect your understanding of the problem. I mean, unless you can clearly see that the problem has some like very non-trivial base cases. 
Uh, but always just like, you know, ask yourself what are like the what is the general formula first. First of all, what kind of recursive function even is this? Like, what is the parameter? Like, what is the value that we're going to pass into the function? So unlike Fibonacci event, it's maybe unclear, right? Like, what what parameter should we pass into this function? Uh, well, we could we could try one thing, which is obviously very bad. We could try to pass in the array itself and cache the array itself. We uh, like like you know uh, basically f of this array has some solution. That's true. We could we could do that, and then maybe we can express the solution in terms of solutions of like subarrays, and we can pass arrays around. Uh, we can probably tell that this is going to be like very slow. Uh, because we're going to have to copy arrays, and we're going to have to like, you know, look up arrays in a map. Uh, yeah, this is not great. Okay, how about this? Um, well, be before we can really say, like, let's just think about the structure of this, right? So, the robber basically the robber looks at the first house, and the robber has two choices essentially: the robber can rob or the robber can not rob, right? So, what happens if the robber robs this house? Then the robber's payoff is, uh, okay, I'll call A the array of values, or I'll call it B. B is the, val B is the basically the values array. I'll call it B. Um, and so b basically uh, option one, is rob. Option one, rob. Uh, so if the robber robs the zeroth house, you know, we'll use indexes. Index zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. If the robber robs this house, then he gets payoff V of zero. He captures this 10. And additionally, he may get other value elsewhere. Right, which is why we're adding this plus sign. Okay, what other value can he get? So after he robs this house, he cannot rob the next house. So the sub problem, now, now the robber can rob any of these remaining houses with the same constraint as before. The constraint being that you cannot rob two in a row. Right, but starting at this house, the second house. Okay, so uh, we can write this, like we, we, can, only, we can see that uh, this function is gonna be expressed in terms of like with the starting point at which the robber can start robbing again. Okay, so this gives us kind of an idea. Um, well, for now, let's just kind of put f of 2, 15, 6, 12, 2. So the robber has to solve this subcase. But this is really the subcase starting at index 2. So I'll note that this is subcase, this is basically a slice of the array. This is the original values array. Uh, I'll use kind of slice notation to depict this, 2 to n. I'm not sticking exactly to Python notation. This means like, start, you know, take the, take the values array and slice it to start at index 2 and end at end. You still don't want to implement it this way because this will copy parts of the array. And, you know, we'll get to the actual like, concise and beautiful representation. But this is just conceptual. Right? We, we, first, we want to analyze it conceptually. Uh, and option two is don't rob. So if the robber doesn't rob this house, then what happens? He doesn't get a payoff for this house, right? But he can rob the next house. So essentially, that it just reduces the problem to a case with one less house where he's at the first, where he's at the next house. So then this one is worth f of v 1 to n. Okay, so now, and now how do you combine these values? So, okay, this is the robber's first choice. So what we're interested in is basically, what is f of b? What is, like, let f of b be the robber's, you know, best payoff with given array b. Given this array, this is the robber's best payoff. And this is the top level value we want. So I write f of b, and I know the robber has this option, and the robber has this option, right? Okay, which of these two choices does the robber make? Well, he should evaluate what both are and pick the best one, right? So this is a max. Okay, so now, unlike Fibonacci, it's not a sum, it's a max. Okay. 
the, this term, in the, 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 it, it's a max between these two terms. This term corresponds to not robbing, and this term corresponds to, or sorry, this term corresponds to robbing the first house, the zeroth house. Uh, and this term corresponds to not robbing that house and maybe skipping to another house. Okay. Uh, but now, uh, this is kind of ugly, like passing arrays in the function. And we realize that whenever we slice an array, we only slice it until the end. So now this gives us an idea for a better way to define the function. Let, let f of i, where i is some integer index, be best solution with b from i to n. Does that make sense? So basically, initially, when you want to solve it for the entire array, the value I want is f of 0. I want, like, given this array, I want to know the best solution with using the entire array, starting at 0 and going to the end. And now I can rewrite this. This is just going to be f of 2 here. Much simpler. And the, and the don't rob option is just f of 1. So this is the general case of this recursion. So well, well this is not uh, a specific case yet. This, uh, we just got this by example for the first index, but we can generalize it. So basically, the solution to f of zero, which according to this definition is the best solution over all of v, all over all of the value array, is the maximum of v of zero, the first value, plus the best solution starting at the second index. <coughs> So take that and evaluate it, and also evaluate here, right? Also evaluate for f of 1, which is just starting here. Okay, so now we have to generalize it. We have to uh, write a, a formula for f of i, right? But that should be easy. We see that the same logic applies everywhere. f of i equals f of 0, uh, or, you know, it equals this. Here we should substitute with i. Uh, here it's going to be i plus 2. And here it's going to be i plus 1. Now, uh, you know, let's check out that this makes sense. So basically, if I'm at some point, if I'm saying I want to solve this on, you know, let, let's say I'm at index 3 or whatever, and I want to solve the, I want to get the best solution from index three to the end, then what choices do I have? Yes, I can either take v of the index I'm currently on and then skip forward two because I can't rob the next one and just ask what is the best solution from there. Or my other choice is basically uh, to skip the current one and get the best solution starting from the next index. So this function is expressed in terms of itself. And fundamentally, it's because uh, I know that, for example, if I rob this house and I'm forced to skip the next house, and now I'm starting here, I, the robber will rob like the best houses here. You, we, we can kind of prove that it couldn't be anything else that would be the optimal solution. Let's, make, let's say the robber solves this portion of the problem going from like here to the end in some suboptimal way. He chooses this house instead of this one, right? Then the, his, then the robber's solution, starting at this index, is not optimal either. Because you can kind of use a copy and paste argument. You can say, if the robber doesn't do the best possible thing here, you could replace whatever the robber does with, with the best thing he could have done. And that would also increase the, the, like this solution, right? If, if you did anything other than the optimal value here, we could replace whatever value you got here with, with the optimal value. And that would increase, the, that would increase this expression. So we know that basically after choosing to rob the house or not rob it, the robber's next decision will be to solve the problem optimally from where he is at that point, whether it's two houses down or one house down. If the robber robs, then he skips the next house and solves the problem optimally from here. We know he solves it optimally. If he doesn't solve it optimally, then his overall solution is not optimal because you could substitute in the optimal solution. Um, and if he, if he chooses not to rob, then he solves the problem optimally from here. Again, if he doesn't solve it optimally, if he solves it some other way, 
then we could just substitute in the optimal solution and it would increase the value that the robber gets. So, so we know that after making his decision, the robber solves the rest of the, you know, if, if we're going to get an optimal value uh, for the overall problem, we know that after making his decision, the, ro the prob robber solves the rest of the uh, problem optimally. So then if f of i is the best solution, starting at index i, then it's equal to this, you know, the value currently captured plus the value of two down, or you can skip the current value and just get the optimal solution one down. Uh, so any questions on, you know, like deriving this formula? Does this like make sense to everyone? Okay, so now the next question we have to ask is how do we solve this recursion? So there's basically two options. We can solve it using dynamic programming, or we can solve it with plain old recursion. Yep, question? So why don't we have these cases? Yeah, you still need a termination. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, like, I, like I said, uh, usually I just kind of focus on the general case first, because the base cases are usually easy to figure out. But sure, if you want to do it now, uh, rather than, you know, uh, a little bit later, like, we can find out the base case. So the base case is basically if you're out of bounds, like you're out of houses. So this happens if just, so basically this formula is going to be, uh, it, well, it's going to be defined for all i that, for all i that are in bounds, it's going to be this formula. And if you evaluate an i that is out of bounds, then you, you have no more houses, so we'll just give it zero. Like you're done at that point. If you have no more houses, your best value is zero. So yeah, that, that's basically the base case. Uh, we, we say like if i it is greater or equal to n, you know, where, where this is the number of houses, then, you know, if, if i is greater than or equal to n, then f of i is zero. It basically means like whatever you did put you past the end. And if that's so, then you have no more houses to act on and your payoff is zero. Um, otherwise, you know, otherwise, this is the general case. Otherwise, if this is in bounds, and we, we know that this will never be like negative because we start at zero and these only increment forward. So uh, otherwise, you know, these are just, uh, if, if this is in bounds and we just apply this formula, and of course, even if i is in bounds, i plus two could be out of bounds, which is fine because again, uh, you know, anything that's out of bounds just by the base case evaluates the zero. So for example, if you're at this house, right, your choices are get 12 plus zero, because after you rob this house, you, you would skip here where you no longer have anything. Or you can just start here. And then, you know, your choices are, again, you can either grab this house or you can, uh, you know, skip it, in which case you get zero. Does that, does that make sense? So basically, just if you have no more houses, then your value is zero. Uh, okay. So... Uh, you know, simple enough. Uh, so this is the recursion. Now we have to ask, you know, do we want to solve it with dynamic programming or no? Right? Because uh, maybe we don't want to solve it with dynamic programming. To see if we want to solve it with dynamic programming or not, uh, we have to basically uh, understand, what, like, do we have this case that we saw in the Fibonacci problem where the same subcase is happening multiple times during the evaluation of the recursion. Because if that doesn't happen, then we shouldn't use dynamic programming. If every case is gonna happen exactly once, then it's better for us not to use it because the caching of results that we only like set once and we never ever hit that case where we're calling the function the second time, then we're just placing values into a cache that we will never use. And there's no point to this. It's just kind of slowing things down. Uh, so, uh, the best way to do that is basically, you know, go ahead and uh, sketch out the uh, recursion tree. Like, usually, uh, I mean, I don't know, like, I'm kind of more experienced with dynamic programming, so when I see this, I, like, immediately know that clearly there are overlapping subproblems here. There are, you know, identical subproblems that will happen in the evaluation of the recursion, and in fact, this is almost the same scenario as Fibonacci. Uh, but if you didn't know that, you can sketch it out. So basically, just take an example and, you know, say like, okay, here you have f of zero. Okay, just sketch out the first, like, usually like two or, two or three tiers 
Okay, so f of 0 we'll call f of 1 and f of 2. And f of 1 we'll call f of 2 and f of 3. Aha, there we go. Now we know we have overlapping subproblems. This is very similar to the Fibonacci case, right? Uh, same kind of pattern. And we, remember what we said earlier, if we have even like even a single subproblem that occurs twice, the problem is this is self-similar, right? So if we get two f of twos, we're going to get like four f of fours, and we're going to get like six. We're going to get eight f of sixes. These are going to multiply because each one is self-similar to this pattern. This one will expand into two f of fours, and so will this one independently. So we know that we absolutely like must. Uh, engage in caching here, or else this is going to blow up exponentially, like it did earlier. Um, you know, you might wonder, like, when should you not do dynamic programming? It's worth mentioning. Um, it's basically whenever you can clearly see that the subproblems can never overlap. Uh, for example, one example is merge sort. Uh, so in merge sort, you're basically sorting an array and you know the action can be characterized by you know sorting between an index i and an index j. And the way merge sort works is you sort between index zero and n minus one, and you, you basically do it by splitting the range in two. Uh, and so you have one case that will that will uh, go from zero to roughly like n over two, and you have another case that will go from n over two plus one or something to n minus one, roughly speaking. You know, plus minus ones, you know, it's not important conceptually right now. But you can see that these two cases are completely distinct from one another. Because basically in merge sort, you are operating on the left side of the array, which has one set of values that are completely independent from the values you have on the right side of the array. And furthermore, like when this does more action, like this just kind of splits its own range in half. This is like 0 to like n over 4. This one is n over 4 to n over 2. And these are completely non-overlapping and independent of each other. And because that's the case, for merge sort, you would never think to attach a cache, because there's nothing to cache. Every case evaluated by merge sort is completely independent and distinct. And this is you know, kind of like the idea of divide and conquer, right? So in, generally, in a, in a divide and conquer algorithm, you, you divide into kind of independent pieces. And if you do that, if, if you've divided a problem into completely independent pieces that have no overlap, then you don't need dynamic programming. It won't help you, because every case only occurs once. And so even if after getting the case, you cache it, it it's not going to help you, because uh, you will never see that same case again. You will never hit the line that retrieves it from the cache. Uh, but uh, if your problem doesn't have this kind of structure, where each piece is completely independent, uh, then you may encounter the same subcase twice. For example, in this problem, as we saw. Um, you know, another kind of example of a situation where you don't encounter the same subcase twice would be binary search, if you implement binary search recursively. Because binary search, again, you know, you can think of it as searching between index 0 and n. And then it's kind of very similar to merge sort, right? Except instead of like evaluating both the left half and the right half, you evaluate one or the other. So maybe here you will evaluate 0 to n over 2, or conditionally, maybe it's another case, but you will only get one, you will only continue your search on one of these two ranges. So like maybe it's this one, for example, in this execution. And then maybe, you know, after another comparison, you narrow your search down to this. But you can see that here, there's never going to be any overlap between the cases, because these the binary search is just shrinking the range, right? There can never be an identical case and in fact, uh, anytime you have a recursion, anytime you have a recursive function that only calls itself once per call, you can rest assured that unless the recursion is circular, uh, in which case dynamic programming won't work anyway, and neither will any recursive method, unless the recursion is circular, unless it like gets back to itself or something, uh, you can never have uh, any overlap here, right? Because like, what cases would overlap? There's nothing. There's not a tree where like, the same thing can occur in two different parts of the tree. Uh, each case is obviously independent of all the previous cases, because if, say, like, this next case were the same as one of the previous cases, then it would be circular. 
Uh, so if there's not any kind of like recursive tree of calls, then there can never be any overlap. So any recurs recursive function that calls itself strictly once, even if it like has like two call sites, but it's conditional like binary search, right? In the code of binary search, you may see two invocations to, to binary search, but they're conditional. It's like if you're greater than the target that you call one, otherwise you call the other. Binary search will never call itself twice. Uh, you, the, well, the same, the same uh, a particular invocation with a particular set of like i, j, you know, particular set of uh, index parameters will only call itself once. So uh, you can never have, unless, unless it's badly written and it's incorrect and it's circular, you will ne never ever have a scenario in that case where you would need dynamic programming because you never, you can guarantee that you never have overlapping subproblems. So it's really basically comes down to that. Do you have overlapping subproblems or no? If you have overlapping subproblems and you don't do anything about it, you are basically almost guaranteed uh, this kind of like exponential blow up if you don't use dynamic programming. But if you don't have overlapping subproblems, then the technique is useless and you'll only slow your code down by having it. Your code will still be correct. The cache will just never do anything. So it'll be like a very unnecessary use of the technique. And it'll like slow you down somewhat, but you know, it might not even affect your big O time complexity, but it might, you know, really like hurt on the constant factors. All right, so now we've decided we should use that ad programming here. All right, so uh, of course, and now we can just use the mechanical transformation I discussed earlier. I'm not gonna like, you know, apply it here because at this point it should be like very clear how to apply it. It's the same steps as before, right? Uh, basically, we will, you know, uh, insert some logic in front here that basically says, that basically says if, uh, you know, if the value is in the cache, then just return the cached value. Otherwise, uh, you know, if this, then return value equals zero. Otherwise, return value equals equals uh, this expression. Um, you know, and then down here, like, cache gets the return value and then return the return value. It's the same template as I showed before, you just different code that you substitute in into that line where I previously had, like, redval equals computation, right? It's like different code that you would substitute in, but the template is exactly the same. And what is the time complexity analysis here? How many distinct cases do we evaluate here? Uh, what, what do you what, what, what do you guys think? How many how many distinct sets how many distinct arguments can this function f be called with? Yeah. N, right? Because it, it can be called from anything from zero to like n minus one. Okay, so number of number of distinct uh, function arguments is n. Okay, how much time is spent in this function? Remember, don't count the time spent inside this function. Count just the order one for the function invocation. So we have order one here, we have order one for the add, we have order one here, we have a max of two things, that's again order one if the things are integers. So everything's order n. I mean, sorry, order one. Uh, every, you know, sub is order one, there's not like a loop or anything. Okay, so n times order one, okay, great, order n. Okay, so yeah, this is a problem we can now solve using dynamic programming. Now, you know, I mean, I heard a pretty good joke about this problem, which is that, like, obviously, uh, this won't help the robber, right? Because the robber can never solve, you know, the robber doesn't know how to solve this problem, because if the robber did, right, the robber wouldn't rob houses, he would just get a job at Google, pays better, right? Yeah, uh, I thought that joke was pretty good, yeah. Does this work if the values in the array are negative? Um, does this work if the values in the array are negative is the question. Well, we kind of wrote this assuming the values would be positive, so we do have to revisit it and think, but probably yes. Well, let's see. So the robber, yeah, because the robber is, an, is never like forced by this equation to rob a house. The robber can always pass on robbing the house. So yeah, if the robber doesn't pass, then he robs the house and then moves two, but he can always pass. So, so, so yeah. It's still the same. Like for every house the robber can choose to rob and not to rob. Of course, if the value of the house is negative, it would never be optimal for the robber to rob, but this equation will figure it out automatically. This equation takes that into account. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Um, so for the time capacity, the general formula that uh, we discussed earlier, yeah. is it like the same for this regular recursive function? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Remember, we talked about how, like, for a general, for for like a state. Oh, okay. I'm uh, I may be misinterpreting your question. Uh, so yes, that that like template applies to pretty much like almost any yeah like any function. Uh, so it applies to this problem and to the Fibonacci problem and to other problems we might face. However, um, the like if without dynamic programming, if we just did naive recursion, like if we just implemented this without undergoing that transformation uh, to insert uh, like logic for getting the cache and then saving to the cache afterwards, if we skip that, it could be it would actually be exponential. Because remember, we discussed that earlier, right? We saw that in the Fibonacci problem, you get exponential blow up. So here you would too, actually. And that is a kind of a pretty general principle, as I showed, because if ever you have a duplicated subproblem, then after, you know, because it's all self similar, after it goes down more, you get exponentially many, uh, you know, problems. The only time that wouldn't cause exponential complexity is maybe like, let's say you're not decrementing by one or by two. Let's say you're doing something like, I don't know, like dividing by two. Like, like maybe, maybe the tree is very shallow. If the, recursion, if the recursion tree is very shallow, then maybe in some cases you would not get an exponential running time. But you'd have to analyze the exact problem to know what the running time is. For dynamic programming, it's always like simple though. It's always like if, you know, just take the number of distinct cases, take the time per case and multiply them together. It's very simple to calculate because you know that every, the function will be evaluated once for every distinct value of the parameters. So essentially, uh, you know, just count how much time is spent in the function per parameter, count how many parameters, and maybe get a time complexity. It may actually be easier to analyze than the recursive version in some cases. Like, you know, uh, in the Fibonacci problem, you might have gotten confused. Is the time complexity two to the n over two with power? Is it like Fibonacci of n? Is it two to the nth power? Uh, dynamic programming can actually be like very, very clear what the time complexity is. And the time complexity, as we saw, can be much better. It can go down to order n from being exponential. Uh, okay, so uh, now, you know, how about a bottom-up solution? Can we do a bottom-up solution here? Uh, what do you think? Yes. Yes, of course, right, because uh, it's, it's very clear what the evaluation order is. It's, it's basically the reverse of what we had for Fibonacci. So here, smaller values of i depend on higher values of i. So a clear, valid evaluation sequence is to start with the last one first, right? Well, you know, first populate the base cases. So basically, uh, what base cases do I need? Well, each one, each valid case looks up to two forward. So I will need, like if this one is index n minus one, right, if this one is index n minus one, then I will, this one could call f of n and f of n minus n plus one, right? f of n minus 1, uh, I need like the plus 2 and the plus 1 version of that. So, you know, I, I should start by basically saying like, you know, let's c be the cache. I would start with something like this, c of n equals 0, c of n plus 1 equals 0, and then I would basically have a loop where, you know, again, this turns into a very, very simple program for, you know, uh, some value x from starting from n minus 1 and then going down to 0, I would just basically say that the, the value of c of x is equal to, uh, you know, this expression basically, but substitute every call to f with just an axis to the cache. So I would basically say c of x equals max of, and then the argument here, here would be like v of x, uh, you know, x is now the index parameter. Okay, I'll just make i to be consistent. Uh, v of i uh, plus c of i plus 2. You know, so take this argument and also compare it to v of i plus 1. Okay, so you, you know, you see how this is like a very kind of mechanical transformation again from the, from, as, once you come up with the evaluation order, like, this is the part that requires creativity, actually. It doesn't seem like it because it's just so trivial in this example. But on some problems, like, it may not be obvious what the evaluation order should be. But once you come up with the evaluation order, it's easy to, uh, then, then it's basically just a mechanical transformation. 
you kind of order the cases to be evaluated in this way, and now it's like, okay, you know, instead of, like, n now you just say, well, okay, so fully following that template you gave, technically this is like red val, and then we do, then we do uh, c of i equals red val. But, you know, this is, we, we can then simplify this by just moving this line here. You mean c of i plus 1, right? Not v of i plus 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. I put the wrong letter. <laughs> yeah. Good, uh, good catch. It's c of i plus 1. Uh, because basically calls to the function get replaced by calls to the cache. So, so, so here, um, the base case is like this logic got transferred over here. Um, then we kind of unrolled this into a loop. This, here we gave the evaluation sequence. And here we said return value, which is this. Right is max of this. Uh, replace the call to the function by by just accessing the cache. Uh, this and then uh, you know this is the return value. Uh, C of i equals this, and then I optimize this line away. I put this here, and then of course we will need like some final return, and the return is just C of zero, right? Like what we wanted is C of zero, the overall solution. Yeah. Uh, I saw a question somewhere. Has it been resolved? Yep. So uh, you said that it's uh, it's not the divided conquer strategy, here, right? Correct. The greedy strategy. Here? No, no. This is this is not. Um, no, this is not the greedy strategy. This is not the divide and conquer strategy. This is still like dynamic programming. Uh, uh, I mean, okay. So basically, our technique was to express the solution recursively. Then we looked, okay, should we solve it using divide and conquer, which is just, which is just like the same as saying we're going to do it like using like naive recursion. Uh, you know, should we, should we just use, do it using naive recursion because the, these cases are kind of like completely like divide and conquer, they're completely independent, like in the case of merge sort or binary search or something like that. Or should we use dynamic programming because the cases are overlapping. And here we said they are overlapping, therefore do this solution. Okay, so we only have about 20 minutes left, but that's great. We will do uh, basically um, one uh, final problem, which will really kind of start to illustrate the power of this technique. Uh, we will do you know a problem that's a lot less trivial, and you know maybe maybe more com you, you know you will definitely think that you know maybe you're starting to see the power of dynamic programming in this problem. Um, you know, first I do want to mention that there are like some conditions that you have to meet to use dynamic programming, right? It's worth noting that like um, in order to use that to use this caching method, your function has to be deterministic. Like in other words, if f of two could produce a different value on each call, then you could not cache it. So this is kind of for like functions that essentially have like kind of a mathematical value. Uh, you know, these are like you know what might be called a pure function. A function that uh, uh, a, a function that doesn't have like any non-determinism to it. Like for example, if f can return a random number that is generated by like some external state or random number generator, then you cannot you cannot cache the value, right? So that's one important thing to understand. That of course this caching optimization it does depend on the function values being deterministic. It must be that when you substitute in a previously computed value instead of computing it all over, that is actually valid because there was no external state that wasn't captured in your arguments that it depends on. So, so if a function you know, reads some external variable that is not passed as part of the arguments and that external variable can change, then you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot use uh, dynamic programming, right? Uh, you, you would have to like recompute that value every time it comes, and then usually to use that in programming, you have to like put all of the state of the function. Anything that can change has to be placed inside the function arguments, so that it can be part of the memoization scheme. You cannot, uh, you know, just like read external variables that could change over time. So, for example, reading the array is fine. It was fine for us to have a function f of i that actually, like, when you go to write the code, you actually wouldn't have written, like, f of i. You would have probably needed to pass around the local array, right? You would have passed around, like, the array 
you know, I think we call them B in that problem. So in the actual in, in actual recursive code, um, we would have actually like made this function probably a function of I and V because we just need to pass this array around. But we don't modify this array, so we don't need to like include it in our in our memoization, right? We're only like including I it as uh, I is the only real parameter. V is basically fixed for the duration of the program. Uh, so you know you might have, when you do dynamic programming, you often pass around like helper arguments to your functions. Like you you might pass around the array. You might pass around uh, you know you also pass around the cache uh, as the function arguments too. If, if it, like in the uh, code I showed, I made the cache a global variable, but probably you don't want to create global variables in your code, right? So usually what you do, um, a common way to set it up is like, you know, if I wanted to write code for this robber problem, I would basically do something like this. I would say, you know, here's my function declaration for the robber. This is basically the, fu the public interface. This accepts an array B, and this is just the interface I want to have publicly. But internally, I actually do something like this. I say return robber, then this is my actual uh, robber helper. You know, I'll create a function called robber helper. Uh, and I'll pass the parameter zero. This is the parameter I really want to pass. And then I will pass the array B, which will never change, so it doesn't need to be. Uh, th th this is uh, basically fixed for the duration of the program, so I don't need to worry about uh, or the duration of this function, so I don't need to worry about caching it in any way. Um, this is just kind of like a constant I'm passing around for convenience, and then I, I should pass around a cache itself. Where's the cache going to come from? If it doesn't live globally, well then I create it right here, and I just go ahead and pass it. This object will be lost once this function returns, which is fine, I don't need the cache after this function returns. And then I will define another function called robber helper, so this is a very common, by the way, this is like a really common pattern when you see dynamic programming solutions. Just in practice, you know, often you need more variables, and often you need your public interface to be like something different, right? The public interface here demands that you accept only one parameter, which is the array, but internally you need to pass this. So yeah, you will, you know, pass this. And here I will just pass like i, b, and cache. And here I will use these, and then here, whenever I need to call this function, I will invoke it like so. You know, I will say like robber helper i plus one v cache. And all of these variables are just kind of riding along. The cache itself is just for the you know purpose of implementing the algorithm. It's not a real argument to the function. And this v is also kind of riding along. It's just a constant or a constant for the duration of this program's execution. Uh, you know, uh, in the previous example I showed where I avoided this, it was because I just kind of made this variable a global. But in practice in your code, you don't want to make it a global, so you will pass things around like that. Um, uh, sometimes in, in Python, in Python supports this feature where like, you can nest functions inside other functions, and then those functions automatically capture the outer parameters. So then, you know, you can use that maybe to uh, make this even simpler. But in a kind of a language agnostic way, that's the most general way to do it. If you want to avoid creating global variables, which you should. You just create like an outer helper function that j its only purpose is to call the recursive function and you know, supply any cache that that needs. Okay, now I, I, I want to go on to the final problem. I want to make sure we do it. Uh, so, this problem I'm going to call this the coin bulldozer problem. So, uh, you know, not a standard game for it, like other people may have other names. But it's an example of a grid problem, a problem that's two-dimensional. And so the idea is you have a grid, and you start in this corner. And you have to reach this other corner. So this is like your starting location, and this is the end location. And in every cell of this grid, there's some number of coins. Like maybe there's four, two, three. Uh, this is getting too big of an instance now. Let's just you know, make it a little smaller. OK. Uh, just putting some random numbers here. Let's say you know, all the numbers can be positive. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much, though. So 
In this problem, your goal is to get from start to finish, picking up as many coins as possible. And the only thing is that you are allowed to only go down and right. So like, of course, you know, the best way to pick up all the coins would be to snake back and forth like this, right? Just get everything, if they're all positive at least. Uh, but in this version of the problem, you will be allowed only to go uh, down and to the right. So in other words, you have to take kind of like a sort of optimally efficient route to the exit, if you think about it. Like you're not allowed to kind of like snake back and around. You just have to go right and down to reach the exit. But on your way there, you want to pick up as many coins as possible. Uh, okay, so what is like the general approach to, to like solving this? Um, so the general approach is like we should try to express some function, like recur we should try to express the solution to this recursively. We can assume that you know this 2D array itself will be a parameter we pass to the function, but that won't change over the course of the evaluation. So we can't, we're not going to edit this array or anything like that. So it's kind of just like another one of those constants that we'll be passing around in our recursive function. Uh, but what are the true arguments to this? Like how should we express the solution? Well, ideally, like, okay, so we think of it as like we start it here and we want to reach the end. Now, basically every step of the way we have one of two choices to make. We can either go right or we can go down. Now, if we go to the right, it's as if our subproblem has been reduced to just this like bolded box here, right? Like it's, it's just, it's as if we just reduced it to this piece. Because if you go to the right, and you're only ever allowed to go to the right and down, you can never come back to this row. So this row is essentially eliminated if you make this choice. So now we see we have a smaller <coughs> subsystem here, one that just cuts out the leftmost row. A and we pick up what, and either way, regardless of which choice we make, we pick up whatever value was in here. So we say like cell 0, 0 is always the starting cell in this problem. Like maybe it also has a value. But no matter what, you'll always pick it up. And I don't know, maybe the ending symbol also like has a value. Uh, you know, why not? Let's just make it consistent. They all have values. But this one you're guaranteed to pick up because you're required to end up here. Um, likewise, what happens if you go down? Let's say instead you make the choice to go down. Well, now you can, you, now it's cut out the topmost row, right? Since you can only ever go right and down. Like your problem is now limited to this subproblem. You see? So basically, uh, either way, you cut out like one row or one column. Uh, yeah, earlier I think I said row instead of column, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, if, you go, if you go right, then you cut out the leftmost column. If you go down, you cut out the topmost row. Um, so it kind of naturally makes sense to uh, have the parameters you pass around, because again, you don't want to modify the array. You, don't, you, you could cache the array directly in dynamic programming, but you don't want to do that because remember, um, then our programming has to like actually like look up these things in the cache, and that could be like very slow, right? Uh, looking up an array in a cache because then you have to like cache the array by iterating over its elements. Very bad. Uh, you want to try to cache small things that are fast to look up in a map. So you want to cache, you know, like in the previous problem we saw, we didn't want to cache the subarray. We wanted to cache the index i j, right? Or in the previous problem it was just index i. So we can do a similar trick here. Conceptually, we think that we're kind of passing the array, but it's better to just refer, refer to it as the index at which we kind of make the cut. So at 0, 0, we're passing the whole thing. Um, and if, if we were called to call f with 1, 0, 1, 0, that would mean that we have an x of 1 and a y of 0. So an x of 1 would be this. Uh, you know, I'm using like the standard X, Y conventions. Oh, okay, uh, you know, uh, this is very, like, very natural for me, but maybe some people are confused by it. Like Y is, usually, usually I use kind of this convention. Y goes down and X goes, right? Why does Y go down? Well, it doesn't have to. Like you can pick any convention you want and just refer to it consistently and your solution will work out. Uh, but this is like what's usually called like image coordinates, right? Like when you have like a, image, right? Usually, usually you have like an x position that's calculated this way and a y position that's how many like pixels you are from the top. So I usually use this convention. You don't have to, you can, you know, 
Instead of saying that the initial problem that I want to solve is f of 0, 0, you could say that the initial problem I want to solve, like if, if y starts at 0 here and goes up, you could say the initial problem I want to solve is like 0, you know, y dot size minus 1 or whatever, you know, grid dot size minus, dot y size minus 1. You, you can give this a different coordinate than 0 if you want. Uh, as long as you consistently use the same convention throughout the problem, it will work out. Uh, but here, I'm just kind of following this convention where, you know, y goes down this way. So, like, so this is y. It goes 0, 1, 2, 3. And this is x. And x goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. This is the convention I'm using here. Uh, so I will say f of 0, 0 is basically the solution where the upper left corner starts here. So it's a solution to the whole thing. Now, if I decide to go right, so I have two choices, right? So again, similar structure to before, two choices. What are my two choices? I can go right. If I go right, then I capture this value. Well, I actually capture this value unconditionally. So I'll do this outside of the choice logic. So unconditionally, um, let, let's call this array, this array is going to be called G for grid. OK, so G i, j, um, and now I will write this kind of generally as f of i, j. This is basically the best value if you, if you start at x, or uh, let me write x, y, that's probably clearer. X, f of x, y is the best value you can get if you started at position x and y. So in other words, if x equals 2 and y equals 1, so x equals 2 is here, y equals 1 is here. That would be basically the solution to this subproblem. It would be like if you are currently here at this value, and you can only go right or down from here. So basically, f of like 2, 1 would be like f of x equals 2 and y equals 1. And f of 2, 1 would refer to the optimal solution. If you're here, and you have to solve the problem from here. Whatever that optimal solution is, that is the value of this function. OK, so what we want to do now is ultimately we want to get f of 0, 0. If we want to know what is the maximum number of coins. You might also wonder, like, how do I actually recover the optimal path? That's easy to do, and I'll show you how to do it later. But first, let's just start computing the maximum number of coins. So f of 0, 0 is our overall solution that we want. So we want f of 0, 0. But to find f of 0, 0, we really need to first you know, give a general expression for x and y, and then we'll use that to evaluate 0, 0. OK, so what is f of x and y? Well, let's say this is your x and y. Then you get the current grid coordinate. Wherever you are, you get the current grid coordinate, and you get that many coins. So you get g of x, y. That refers to you know, how many coins are in this grid array for that position, plus after you pick up your coins, you have to make a decision of where you want to move, and then from there you pick up more coins. So how many more coins do you pick up? Well, it depends which choice you make. You have two choices, right? So what is choice number one? Choice number one is you move to the right. So that means f of x, f of x plus 1, y. Now, again, there are, there's going to be base cases here. But this is just kind of writing the general formula first to give us the best understanding of what we're doing in this problem. So let's try to write the general formula first. And like here, I want to do the max. OK, g of x and y plus the max of, because we want to make the best of two choices, right? So the, the first choice is we move to the right, and then our x is increased by 1 from our current position, and our y is not increased. So x plus 1, y. And then the other thing is uh, we could move down. If we move down, uh, then our x is not increased, but our y is increased, right? If we go, we're at 0, 0, and we move down, now we're at 0, 1. <coughs> OK. So basically, uh, this is the general case. Uh, and this is all. And now, uh, this is all for the general case. What is the, essentially like the base, the, uh, the, what are the base cases? Well, the base cases are um, if you go out of bounds, right? 
Now, there's different ways you can write the base cases here. Some are more complicated than others. You, you could write it as so like, this is the general case, but only if x plus 1 and y plus 1 are both in bounds. If you are either on this bottom, bottom uh, row or this rightmost column, then you have to use a different equation that, that only includes one of these terms. And finally, if you are already on the last spot, then, then just return 0 as part of this expression and just capture this value. If you are here, then you just capture the value and you're done. Um, now, we can probably, uh, you know, capture this like maybe somewhat more elegantly if we just say that when you're out of bounds, you get a value of like negative infinity to add to your sum or something. So if you're if you go out of bounds, like for example, if you're here and you decide to go down, this cell returns negative infinity, and so you would never choose to go there, and you would always go here. Uh, that's kind of maybe just like a simpler kind of way of doing it. So you would say basically uh, this is the general formula, but before you apply you know, the general formula, uh, you might have these base cases apply to you. So uh, base cases, and you would just basically put the code for them before you put this code. Uh, and, the, and the base cases are, uh, you know, if x or y out of bounds, basically. So basically, if x is greater than max x, where you know max x is just derived from the size of the grid, uh, or y is greater than max y, if either of these conditions happen, uh, if either of these things are out of bounds, then return negative infinity. Uh, Likewise, we, we need to have one more base case, right? We need to have a we 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 need to have a base case for the final spot because we need to tell it not to go further. If we didn't have a base case here, then uh, basically because both this evaluates to negative infinity and this evaluates to negative infinity, and the max of two negative infinities is still a negative infinity, you would kind of like still get a bad result here. You would think that this is negative infinity, but it's not because you can stop. So if you're on the last cell, you're allowed to stop. You kind of have a third option of stopping if you're on the last cell. So, uh, but, and in fact, we have no other option. So you, we, we also include another base case where we basically say if x equals equals max x and y equals equals max y, then return uh, grid of x, y. So, in other words, this is a base case. If we're in this corner, just return, return, uh, you know, just the value here. If we're somewhere over here, then uh, this is actually treated as a general case. This is not treated as a base case. Uh, but as part of the evaluation of something that's on the edge, you will go outside of the edge. And when you go outside of the edge, I give you negative infinity. So you will never go outside of the edge. If you have two choices and one of them is outside of the edge and the other one is not, then that means you will always, you know, because of this max, you will always choose the choice that doesn't lead you to negative infinity. But that's just a trick. If you prefer to make the, all of these cases base cases, you can. Like, you could just say that all of these are base cases. You could have a case where you say, if x equals equals max x, uh, then, you know, you have a different case which, oh, instead of giving you the max of these two things, it just takes one of the values. The one, you know, the one that you're allowed to take. Um, you, you, you could, you know, so you could write like if x equals equals max x, then f of x, y is this plus just this term and you don't get this max in this other term. Uh, and likewise, you could write a base case like that for this edge. So it's kind of, you know, you see, you see that this is a problem where the base cases are kind of quite, quite a bit trickier. Uh, but conceptually, it's not hard, right? It's clear that these are kind of in some sense base cases and so are these. And these are like the general cases. I think it's easier if you define everything except the last cells as a general case and just you know make, it, make going outside of the bounds score negative infinity, then it's easier. Um, so kind of does this make sense? Uh, so this is basically kind of like how you would write the recursive function. And then uh, like here's the great thing about dynamic programming. Uh, basically, once you understand the basic theory, there's nothing else you really like need to do here other than come up with this logic. Now that we've come up with this logic, there's a mechanical transformation that takes us to the, to the situation where we are using dynamic programming to solve this rather than naive recursion, right? So basically, we will write this logic in a method. We will write this logic in code. 
will prepend it with some logic that basically says, you know, if cache contains x, y, uh, we'll, we'll make the object like a tuple. The map key will be a tuple of x and y. So we will say, you know, if the cache contains the pair x, y, then, uh, you know, return the value that exists for that pair. Otherwise, uh, you know, run this evaluation and cache the value before returning. It's the, it's the same transformation. So, you know, if you think of it as like, uh, okay, so here's like some base. Uh, here you have some logic where like, you know, if, you know, if base case, you know, here's some logic that detects the base case, if base case, then uh, uh, return, you know, return whatever. Uh, you have some logic here for what to do. Uh, you assign, you basically assign that retval variable to some value, retval equals something, and you can have like multiple base cases. Otherwise, else retval equals this. This is just applying that template. Um, and then before and after with this block, you will insert, you know, here you will, up here you will insert a check for whether you have x and y in the cache, and here you will insert you know, uh, after you get the red value, you will say cache, uh, you know, tuple x, y equals red value. And then you will return red value. And up here, you know, I ran out of space on the board, but up here you have a check for the cache. And this, and this will basically be like how your recursive function works. Uh, you know. Yeah, I didn't really run out of space here, but you know, here you check cache. Check the cache, then you know, do your computation. This is your computation. Then put your stuff in the cache if you had to do the computation, and then return. Uh, and then this is just like a constructor that constructs a tuple. Like in Python, actually, this is not even needed. You just do this, but like, uh, you know, generally you might have to call some like tuple constructor or whatever. Or in languages that are really like annoying, you might have to like define your own tuple class or whatever. Can we use a two-dimensional array as a cache in this case? Uh, yeah, you can. You can. Um, yeah, oh, okay, so I can discuss this final point before we, before we go. Uh, well, actually, yeah, two more points I want to discuss here. So, uh, yeah, how do you do this cache? So, I, I make it sound like it's a map. It's just a generic like map of some kind, like unordered map. Uh, probably like a hash table, and in the most generic case, that's where you want. That's what you want it to be. You want it to be like some hash map mapping inputs to outputs. And if the input is a tuple, then so be it. But uh, conceptually, uh, like that's what it is conceptually, right? But uh, in the practice of implementation, you can think like what kind of uh, structure satisfies that mapping functionality. So here you see that x and y are all within a small range. You see that the x and y parameters you have are precisely between 0 and x max and 0 and y max. So you can actually just make a 2D array to act as the cache itself. So basically when you begin this algorithm, you can just take an array of the correct size. You know, so uh, it basically in this case it would have to be like as big as this, as this matrix itself. So you just take a, you, you make a new uh, matrix of the same size. Uh, at first it's blank. And you know, maybe you initialize it in some way. Uh, you probably want to initialize it with like, some like marker value that basically says this is not computed yet. Because, because uh, okay, so normally in a map, remember, remember I had the, hash, the cache check implemented as if value is not in cache. But that's like a map operation, right? How do you do it with an array? In an array, every cell is initialized. Well, you have to put some marker value. So initially, I would create a cache where just like every cell uh, is like minus one or something. If I know that minus one is not a value that can occur naturally, like I would just put every cell as like minus one. You know, like initialize an array and then like arrays.fill or whatever, minus one. And then minus one is my, is my you know, uh, cached value, and then I just do something like, uh, you know, what would it be like? Uh, instead of like if tuple x y in map, I would do like if 
if you know if cache x y index, you know, it would be like if cache x and y uh, is not equal to negative one, right? That would be the condition, and this would, uh, or rather, equals negative one, or yeah, sorry is not equal to negative one, and if it's not equal to negative one, that means it's been set to some other value, which means I have already evaluated this and I know what its value is. So I would do the cache check by just doing like if cache x, y is not equal to negative one, and th this means that it is cached, and then I would get like cache x, y here. But, it, but if it is uh, negative one, then it means I have not computed the value yet. Now you might say, what if, what if like the true value can be negative one? What if there's like no safe marker value I can assign that could never arise over the course of my algorithm? Well, then again, okay, one, you could use a map. That's a more general case. Uh, but two, uh, you could also just, uh, you, you, could, you could use another array to create that kind of marker, right? You could create a values array, and you could create like a Boolean indicator array. This seems like it's getting complicated, but uh, time, I mean, time complexity-wise, it could still have better constant factors. Uh, so you can avoid map lookups by doing array lookups instead. You create a Boolean indicator array that basically says, is this value set or no? Uh, or, you know, uh, and if it is set, only then will you read it from the, from the values array, which contains the value. You know, another alternative is some languages give you like an optional type, which internally is just kind of implemented as like, you know, well, it can be implemented different ways, but like, uh, it can be implemented as just kind of a tagged union, meaning like each location of memory just holds one value or the other and remembers which one it has. Uh, of, you know, you, you can make like a optional int 2D array or something. Uh, some, some languages have this construct where they kind of allow you to, uh, even for primitive types like integers, you can have like a nullable integer. So C sharp, for example, has nullable integers. C++ has op the optional template, and so does Java. Uh, you, can, you can have like optional integer or optional int in C++. That would be another way to handle this. But of course, it's easier to just make it a, make the 2D grid uh, your, that is your cache of type int, and then just uh, you know just have a marker value if that's at all possible. But sometimes it's not. Okay, I know we are a little over time, but you know, one kind of final important thing I want to mention is, you know, what is the bottom-up solution here? So you might see that it's not like so easy to find the bottom-up solution. It's not hard either, though. It's just we are basically being asked to find an evaluation order for these cells. Because every function call is basically is trying to evaluate a certain cell, right? It's trying to it's trying to like basically fill a certain cell in the cache. It's trying to fill the value for a particular x, y in the cache. Uh, so, what is you know the uh, what is the evaluation order? So one with one D problems it was very easy, right? Beginning or end. What is like the evaluation order here? Well, there's a couple intuitive ones, and the most intuitive ones are basically like some kind of sweeping line, right? So probably like, like this kind of thing. Ev evaluate the rows from bottom to top, uh, or rather, yeah, evaluate the rows from bottom to top, and within each row, go from right to left. Why is this a valid evaluation order? Because it means that if you are, say, right here, right, it means, you, it means you've already evaluated this value, and you've already evaluated the values below you. The fact that you go from bottom to top on the rows means the rows below you, which you need to access, are already evaluated. And the fact that within each row you're going from right to left means that values to the right of you, which you also may need to access, are already evaluated. So here a valid evaluation order would be a sequence like this. Uh, and so how would you implement this? Well, again, two loops, right? Like you would basically have a loop looping over the, the y coordinate in decreasing order, and you would have a loop looping over the x coordinate in increasing order. You would apply that transformation I showed you where you replace every recursive call with just a check for the cache. Again, kind of mechanical transformation at that point once you found the evaluation order. And then you would write the code. So uh, basically, uh, 
this session is essentially over, we're out of time, but I would like you to try this essentially for the, for kind of like, you know, preparation for the next session. Uh, go ahead and kind of try this as essentially like a little, you know, I don't want to call it homework, but kind of like a homework. You know, this will help you <laughs> practice the concepts of, and this will help you understand uh, this concept, I think, a lot, like dynamic programming. Uh, so please take this problem. So remember, you have basically a grid that can have like arbitrary dimensions, but it's like a, a rectangular grid. It has like some max x, max y. Um, and, you know, it's 2D grid. Every number in it is positive. You start at the upper left corner, go down to the bottom right corner, and you can only move down or right. You collect as many, and you want to maximize the amount of coins you collect on the way. Uh, solve this problem with a top-down solution with dynamic programming, and solve this problem uh, bottom-up as well, using the evaluation order I showed. If you do this, you'll be very well prepared for the next dynamic programming uh, session. In the next dynamic programming session, we will actually start with this problem, and then we will look at complex and interesting variations of this. Um, just one step that I skipped is, I kind of skipped asking like, uh, do we even need to use dynamic programming here, right? Where are the overlapping subproblems? But let's just find them, you know, very quickly. So uh, x, y, we'll call this. Um, and then this one, we'll call x plus 2, y. Uh, x plus 1, y plus 1. Okay, so so far no overlap. Um, but this one we'll call x plus 1, y plus 1, and x, y plus 2, right? Each one in tries to increase the x and the y value. So now we found our overlapping subproblems. So you see now that this problem does have overlapping subproblems as well, and if we don't use dynamic programming, then these two x plus 1s, y plus 1s will become 4 x plus 2s, y plus 2s, and so on. 